How did a few tourists become Australia's most prolific money launderers? Hey everyone, it's Detective Harry here. Today's story is the fascinating tale of how a gang of unassuming Vietnamese nationals mastered the criminal network in Australia, becoming the go to money launders for the underworld. Laundering over nine figures in the space of a few years, it's an incredible story about the failure of governments and the underworld's ability to exploit every weakness in our financial systems. Sit back, relax, let's dive in. It was January 2016. The sun was shining down in Sydney. Holidaymakers were gathering on Bondi Beach in rows of tanned skin and spandex soaking up the sun. The aquamarine Sydney Harbour was awash with full-sailed white yachts. But Van Kien Do wasn't feeling festive. He was hard at work, trying to launch his new business. Worse still, the technology was failing him, and his boss, Thilan Puong Palm, was highly unsympathetic. Fam was barking orders into a burner phone to do on the other side of Sydney. Mr. Do was acting as what the policing world would call a smurf, named after the miniaturized comic book characters. Just like their blue-skinned counterparts, Smurfs act as individuals doing small tasks to stay unnoticed while they collectively accomplish a bigger goal. Tasks like buying pseudoephedrine for use in producing meth or like do depositing bundles of cash into ATMs. Bundles too small to set off any alarm bells. This is the life of a humble Smurf, the ultimate proletarians of the criminal underworld. Suddenly, Pham let out a cackle of laughter. The Vietnamese hotelier was safely at arm's length on the other side of Sydney. From her vantage point, on the other end of a Viber call, it all seemed rather comical. It was her accomplice Du who was getting himself on CCTV footage, handling the dirty cash, mixing with bikies and gun runners, and apparently taking all the risks. Unbeknown to the embattled Du, his boss was also creaming 80% of the profits from their criminal scheme. What Farm didn't know at that point was that she wasn't nearly as safe as she thought. Pham and Du had already come to the attention of Strike Force Bugum, a partnership between the New South Wales Police and the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission. The Joint Agency Task Force was targeting organised crime and money laundering, and Pam's operation was sitting squarely in their gun sights. Every word she said in Australia, every text message she typed, was being recorded and monitored. Pham would eventually fly home to her young son in Vietnam, where she would manage that side of the operation, bringing in new customers and arranging cash drops for criminal syndicates. But even there, the Australian authorities would be watching and waiting. For decades, Australian police had known that money was the vascular system of the criminal body. Each year, the cops were getting new laws and new tools to help them track, trace, and target the proceeds of serious and organised crime. But they also had a problem. As their detection tools became more sophisticated, the criminals were always becoming smarter. It was a cat and mouse game, and all too often the cats were winning. The sheer volume of work meant the police could only pursue a handful of their major targets. We only catch the dumb ones, or the unlucky, was an all too common refrain from law enforcement officers. In this instance, however, the cops had an edge on the crooks. Detective Sergeant Warren Lysart of the NSW police had become obsessed with the intellectual battle of money laundering. Lysett was a burly cop with square shoulders and a tightly cropped beard. He loved rugby, a laugh with his mates, a beer and his family. Not necessarily in that order. On his phone, his profile picture was the monochrome outline of a skull. Detective Sergeant Lysart was engrossed in this job, tracking major criminal groups and thinking multiple moves ahead. It was a game of underworld chess. He was working day and night with a tight group of colleagues on the FAM case which was in turn blowing. The ACIC in the Australian Federal Police had taken a sudden interest in the case when weapons started moving around the country. The feds wanted to take it over. But fortunately for Warren and his team, the NSW police were firmly backing Strikeforce Bugum. They would see this case through to the end. Strikeforce operations have impressive names, but the reality is often quite different. The sensitive nature of this criminal intelligence work means that it needs to stay tight. Often, a strike force will involve a close team of colleagues, mates who trust each other like spouses and can work together almost as closely. Within the cone of silence of Strike Force Bugum, it wasn't uncommon for secure messages to fly around at 1am about a surveillance job the next day. Wives and kids often had to accept that the job took precedence over family activities. The vehicles they were tracking, filled with drugs, weapons and cash, moved unexpectedly. 
which meant everyone remained on high alert. This camaraderie of strike force work and the thrill of the hunt were what had drawn Lysart to the job. And he was still there two decades later. Detective Senior Constable Ray Malcoon was one of the tight-knit Bugum team members. He was also one of Lysart's best mates and the father of a young family. Malcoon had contracted cancer during the operation and was recuperating at home following some invasive surgery and aggressive chemotherapy. Despite his colleagues' demands, they couldn't keep him off the case. The other team members told him to rest and promised they'd close the job without him so he could recover. But he wouldn't hear any of that. Malcoon was still working on it from home, despite his doctor's orders. The case had come to represent something much bigger than dismantling a single syndicate. They were breaking new ground, discovering new criminal typologies that would lead to the discovery of other criminal networks. They were part of the continual fight to keep an international criminal scourge out of Australia. Each of the Boogum cops would have stepped in front of a bullet to save a colleague. They were dedicated and intelligent professionals, and they were unified by the fact that their targets were the most ruthless of organised criminals. Strike Force Bugum was part of a new wave of investigations that used financial intelligence to trace and disrupt criminal syndicates. In the traditional model, coppers would solve a crime and seize the money. They would then build a profile of the criminal network through the indelible trail of money movements. The Bugum boys turned this model on its head. By starting with the laundering syndicate and following the money backwards, they were finding new criminal offences that would previously have gone undetected. The sophisticated financial intelligence they used, known as graph analytics, helped them build a picture of these interlinked criminal networks. They had a saying, dirty cash always leaves behind a smell. Using intelligence from Ostrak and the ISIC, the police were able to find deep connections among these illicit money flows. They then used this to crack other crimes, with the money trail leading to gun runners, hitmen, crooked cops, and more members of underground syndicates. The commander of Strike Force Bugum, Detective Superintendent Scott Cook of the NSW Police, said in November 2017 that the approach also had another objective, upending the risk-reward equation for serious criminals by seizing their easily earned assets. By focusing on the cash or other proceeds of crime, he said, we're hitting them where it hurts most, profit. Back in November 2015, the Strike Force Bugum investigators began looking into links between money laundering syndicates and what's known as cuckoo smurfing. This is when a syndicate or a money transfer agent acts as an intermediary for a person who wishes to purchase Australian property with foreign currency. The buyer is not aware that when they hand over their foreign currency, they will receive criminally tainted Australian dollars in return. The criminals behind these schemes may offer exceptionally good exchange rates as they're seeking to wash their ill-gotten cash through a legitimate transaction. The Bugum investigation would lead them directly to the trail of Thi Lan Puang Pam. What they found was disturbing. Money remitters in Vietnam were acting as fronts for a major global laundering operation. They would offer to move legitimate funds to Australia for their customers, but instead would dump criminal funds into their Australian accounts. Often, the money would arrive in dribs and drabs as mules worked their way down a train line of ATMs across North Sydney. When it all eventually arrived, customers were usually relieved they had not been defrauded. Like China, Vietnam has foreign exchange controls, which prevent citizens from sending large amounts of money abroad. This drives people into the arms of these Hawala networks and underground remitters. Hawala, or Hundi, as it is also known, is the world's cheapest and oldest way of moving money across borders. It's an informal and untraceable network of money changers who are spread like an invisible mesh around the globe. These systems have served mankind for more than a millennium, having emerged in the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent as far back as the 8th century. Their history has outlasted empires, with multi-generational alliances allowing transfers to take place instantly and with no digital trail is a business that relies on trust. The Hawaladars, who often operate out of legitimate businesses such as grocery stores, news agents and delis, simply keep a written ledger and settle their transactions periodically. Settling ledgers could involve a friend traveling with gold disguised as jewelry, diamonds inside toothpaste tubes, a single large bank transfer disguised as a trade invoice. Or these days, proving the adaptability of this hidden global network a cryptocurrency transaction. In Australia, 
Hawala and Hundi have been largely replaced by the formal financial system as all cross-border transactions must be regulated and reported to Austrac. Remitters must register with the Financial Intelligence Agency and have a compliance program. That sort of rigor is not conducive to the informal nature of the ancient Hawala system. Yet despite the penalties and risk of jail for Hawaladars in Australia, still the networks persist. In some ethnic communities, the appeal is the speed and the low cost. In some instances, the appeal is primarily cultural. That's particularly so among foreign workers. In other cases, users are actively seeking anonymity for their outbound transactions, ranging from simple tax evasion on Australian cash earnings to the financing of terrorist groups like ISIS. In FAM's case, the customers had no idea their clean funds in Vietnam were being substituted with criminal loot in Australia. Some would discover this the hard way when the AFP froze their accounts as the proceeds of crime. Well, after a criminal gang in Vietnam had disappeared with the legitimate funds. In the case of Mrs. Pam, police discovered the hotelier had been acting as the coordinator of a major offshore syndicate. The 42-year-old single mother travelled to Australia in January 2016 on a one-year visa. During that time, she attempted to set up a network of Smurfs who would launder her clients' money under instructions from abroad. Van Keen Doe became Pham's first Australian accomplice. He was introduced to a shadowy figure known as the accountant, who would provide him with the details of cash pickups. After collecting the money, Do would deposit the funds into bank accounts through ATMs, branch tellers and direct bulk cash drops. It was a slick operation. One of the goals of this criminal specialization was to separate the money from the crime. Ever since the days of Al Capone, organized crime groups had known it was dangerous to handle their own dirty linen. More recently, proceeds of crime confiscation laws had made it crucial for gangsters to avoid the vertical integration of their criminal supply chains. Separate the money from the crime had become an underworld mantra. Unfortunately for Pam, by the time she arrived in Australia, the authorities were already on her case. The Vietnamese national bought a mobile phone and a SIM card, which police immediately secured a warrant to bug. During stakeouts and phone surveillance, the police monitored Pham's every move as she taught do the delicate craft of cuckoo smurfing, a reference to the cuckoo bird, which deceives other birds into raising its young. Pham took Du to a number of banks and showed him how to place cash into ATMs, intelligent deposit machines, IDMs, and through branch tellers without arousing suspicion. She taught him to break the money into amounts under the $10,000 currency reporting threshold to move between branches and to ensure he regularly bought new SIM cards and burner phones. They communicated using Viber in the belief it would protect them from police surveillance. The deal was that Du could keep 1% of the proceeds in cash for himself. For the boy from Vietnam, who was struggling to make ends meet in Sydney, it seemed too good to be true. Should I transfer the whole amount or can I retain my commission percentage? He once asked Pham. He was due to receive a bag containing $200,000. Yes, of course, if you receive two, you'll have to forward only one ninety-eight. his handler replied. Sadly for Du, this lucre would not come without a price. When it came to putting money through the spin cycle, Du was not a natural born criminal. During one of his first cash placements on 17th of January, 2016, he was stuck at a Commonwealth Bank smart ATM, unable to deposit the funds. He tapped at the LCD screen, but nothing happened. Du called his boss, perplexed and nervous. Press the button on the bottom left, Pham instructed her hapless accomplice. He tried again, but no message appeared, he assured his boss. Then the machine is broken, she said, before breaking into a hysterical laugh. Cut and run! It was an ignoble start to Du's lucrative new career but the embattled money mule was not ready to give up. He was aware this was a sure path to either prison or riches, and he was willing to keep rolling the dice. Later that month, Du was told that a Caucasian man would turn up at his house to deliver $200,000 in cash. For Du, who knew the individual was linked to organized crime? This was a frightening proposition. Du was given a Vietnamese 500 dong note to use as a token. He was told that the bagman would have a copy of the note's serial number, and this would validate his identity. These 500 dong notes proved to be a common and very effective form of ID among the laundering syndicates and their criminal clients. These people didn't know each other, and it was likely they would never meet again. 
Swapping serial numbers on banknotes was the perfect way for the gangsters to make sure they were handing their bags of money to the right bagman. Still, Du was nervous that these characters would learn where he lived. Hey, tell me, he asked Fam, if someone comes to deliver things, should I let them in? Yeah, you should, Fam replied, from her location well away from the physical cash drop. These people are okay, let them come inside. The house is better. She explained how the transaction would work. They'll give you a bag, just like a bag of gifts. We'll only check the amount after they've gone. If something is short, tell me so that I can let their bosses know. So far, we've been doing right all the time. If we do something wrong, nobody would want to see us again. It's okay, I understand that, Du replied. We need to maintain good credibility. That's right, our company has very good credibility. Fam assured her loyal Smurf. Du had good reason to be cautious. Getting caught by the authorities was the least of his worries. The organized crime group he and Fam were working with was a serious operation. It would go on to launder $42 million between March and August 2016 in proceeds from illicit drug and firearm sales. Members of the syndicate included bikies and an ex-copper. In mid-February, Fam returned to Vietnam, satisfied that Du had the Australian work under control. The accountant, who went by the name Hoa, would give Du instructions with account numbers, BSBs or physical locations for cash drops. Du, ever the entrepreneur, began to build his own network of Smurfs to work under him. Over a six-month period, Du collected and laundered two I-75 million dollars from criminal groups. In doing so, he netted 27 to 500 in cash commissions. Not yet a fortune, but it was easy and their operation was growing. Fam's deal was even better. She was raking in four times that amount and doing so from the safety of Vietnam. By the end of their first year in the money laundering game, Fam and Doe's hustle was booming. After a patchy start, they were pretty confident they had this game wired. It was money for Jam. They had worked out that the Commonwealth Bank's smart ATMs, intelligent deposit machines, IDMs, were the best. As long as the machines weren't full, they accepted the most notes. If a machine had just been emptied, you could wash up to $600,000 in a single sitting at any hour of the day or night. Dirty money would disappear into a hole in the wall and, in real time, corresponding numbers would appear in an Australian bank account. Fam could even watch the money appear in her own accounts from Vietnam. Those criminal funds might end up being used to buy a house or invest in a local business. In some cases, the dirty dosh was used to buy government bonds as part of the Special Investor Visa SIV program. This was the ultimate irony. In effect, the government was helping to launder the proceeds of the illicit drug and firearms trade and handing out five-year visas while they were at it. If it wasn't for the constant police surveillance, Du would have been riding high, as fortune would have it. The syndicate had an even greater stroke of luck that worked in its favor. The Commonwealth Bank was suffering from systemic failures to detect financial crimes. Deposits through the bank's IDMs, those not-so-smart ATMs, were not being recorded on the bank's central transaction monitoring platform. This meant that billions of dollars worth of transactions were taking place in the dark. Two of the most crucial financial intelligence reports are Threshold Transaction Reports, IATRs, and Suspicious Matter Reports, SMRs. TTRs need to be submitted for any transaction of $10,000 or more. SMRs are filed whenever a bank comes across something the layman might call sus. In Fam and Do's case, hundreds of these reports should have been filed with Austrac, which could then examine the transactions with an eye for illegal activity. But for cash deposited via the bank's IDMs, none of these critical reports were being filed. If it weren't for Strikeforce Bugum and some diligent financial intelligence work, Fam and Do's syndicate might have flown completely under the radar. By the end of 2016, Fam was extremely happy with how her Aussie business was running. She was trousering 4% of everything that moved through her clients' accounts. In Vietnam, this represented a huge sum of money for the Bugum team. However, the pressure was mounting. They were under intense duress to wrap up what had been an in-depth and expensive operation. But they were waiting for Fam to return to Sydney. There was a growing belief within the police chain of command that Bugum should swoop on Du. Detective Sergeant Lysart knew this would tip off Fam, though which would ensure she never returned to Australia. 
there was also pressure to hand the case over to the AFP, which had greater resources for long-term organised crime jobs that crossed state and international borders. The team kept monitoring the chatter on the intercepts, hoping for a break. In January 2017, their moment arrived. Pham said she wanted to return to Sydney to oversee her operations and catch up with her loyal accomplice. The pair had a plan to expand the business and needed to speak in person. And what could be better than a work trip to beautiful Sydney at the height of summer? Strike Force Bugham had been patient. Now Pham was swimming into their net. When Pham arrived in the country, it was their time to strike with force. On Wednesday, 18 January, the police swooped on Du, taking him into custody. They kept Pham under surveillance, predicting she would panic and try to flee Australia. Sure enough, a day later, they tailed her to the airport. Pham stood in line, calmly preparing to fly away. The Vietnamese money launderer knew she was taking a big risk flying out that day. But what choice did she have? It seemed the game was over. In the queue behind her stood a burly man. Detective Sergeant Lysart wanted one last coup, access to Pham's phone. His plan was to wait until she used a PIN code to unlock her device. Then he would pounce, ensuring he had access to the treasure trove of evidence. To his amazement, though, she didn't reach for her phone. Before Pham reached the front of the queue, she felt a tap on the shoulder. She was under arrest. When Lysart seized her phone, to his surprise, he found it was unlocked after all. The first thing Lysart did after the arrest was report back to his colleague, Detective Senior Constable Ray Malcown, who was still on leave, fighting to stall the relentless march of terminal cancer. The men were jubilant. It had been an incredible roller coaster operation. They had broken new ground in the understanding of criminal laundering syndicates, and they had caught the handler. Tragically, Malcone's health was not looking great. Deep down, Lysart knew he would soon be at his dear friend's graveside, promising through tears to be there in person for both of them when Pham was sentenced in court. The members of Strike Force Bugham were celebrated within their closed door world. Both the NSW police and the ACIC had executed a difficult job from start to finish. Detective Inspector Stuart Sweeney from the NSW Organised Crime Squad's Money Laundering Unit said the investigation highlighted the need for good intelligence and strong interagency cooperation. While borders can present some investigative challenges, the ever-increasing collaboration of law enforcement across the globe is showing that being outside the jurisdiction will not save you, he said. Farm certainly believed she had distanced herself sufficiently from the scene of the crime. In a police interview, she was brazen, denying all knowledge of the scheme. She claimed to not even know Van Kien Do. When the police handed her a surveillance photo of her and do together at an event, she continued in her denial. He looks like a singer from the USA, she told the investigators. The ruse didn't last long. The evidence collected from mobile phones, security camera footage and stakeouts was undeniable. This was a sophisticated money laundering operation and Pham was going to do a long stretch in Australia at Her Majesty's pleasure and taxpayers' expense. The lessons from Bugham shone a light on a very inconvenient truth about the ever-evolving criminal landscape. Since the introduction of the anti-money laundering regime and the proceeds of crime seizure laws, criminals were loath to hold cash. Their goal was to move their loot as quickly as possible to a dedicated laundering syndicate, such as FAMS. This had given rise to an entirely new industry, the professional money launderer. It was part of the burgeoning crime as a service underworld economy, powered by darknet marketplaces and encrypted chat services. These bag handlers, money movers and underworld accountants could market themselves internationally and charge somewhere between 5 and 10% for their services. Committing a predicate crime, like running drugs or sobbery, was increasingly a fool's game. Many cash businesses had sprouted purely as a front for placing the proceeds of crime discreetly into the banking system. For other cash businesses, such as coffee shops and bars, Money laundering was a side hustle to pay the bills and keep the lights on in what was a tough business climate. But, as Pham discovered to her cost, you couldn't get away with this game forever. In court in Sydney, six, eight hundred kilometres away from her young son and family, the tough Vietnamese businesswoman broke. After resisting for months, she eventually pleaded guilty to one count of directing the activities of a criminal group. The offence carried a maximum penalty of 15 years in prison she was given a sentence of six years jail. Her loyal but unfortunate accomplice to... Meanwhile, 
was sentenced to three years in jail with an 18-month non-parole period. Members of the organized crime group that handled the drugs and guns were also arrested and sentenced with the help of this financial intelligence. For Pham, the daughter of a wealthy Vietnamese family, it was a tragic fall. She sobbed repeatedly during her court appearances. She didn't need to do this work. Reality had bitten hard. For her bank of choice, the situation wasn't much better. Pham's case would eventually be buried inside a 691-page revised statement of claim in the landmark Ostrak v. Commonwealth Bank money laundering case. Pham had taken advantage of the fact that the bank had turned a blind eye to dirty money. It didn't conduct due diligence on the members of the Cuckoo Smurfing Syndicate. It had failed to file hundreds of financial intelligence reports. And it kept criminal accounts like Pham's open for business even after people within the bank's financial crime team had flagged them as highly suspicious. To Ostrak's legal team, Pham was known simply as Person 81, and soon Australians would discover that her journey from running a hotel chain in Vietnam to running a transnational money laundering syndicate in Sydney was nothing extraordinary. There would be many, many more stories like hers. She was but one in a lengthy gallery of rogues. The sad cases of Thilan Phuong Pham and Van Kien Do show the strange lure that colourful strips of polymer hold for humans. Like bowerbirds drawn to something shiny, people are susceptible to the hypnotic allure of banknotes. Their beauty, beyond the intricate artwork and microscopic lettering, is in the promises they hold luxury, freedom, power, love, adventure, retirement or just a slightly easier life. A stroll through the Reserve Bank of Australia's museum in Martin Place, Sydney, offers a glimpse into the intertwined relationship between a civilization and its currency. The lesson from history is clear. Any society that loses control of its currency is destined for collapse. Those who work in financial intelligence, on the side of the cops, are continually amazed by the things people will do to amass money. They will take incredible risks. They will take lives. They will risk their freedom, even their own lives, for the opportunity to clip the ticket in the global marketplace of dark money. Illegal money printing is the bane of central banks and governments the world over. Even the US super dollar, which is printed on a cotton linen substrate with red and blue security fibers, has been hit by sophisticated counterfeiting attacks. This threat doesn't come only from criminal syndicates, but also from state-based actors. North Korea is believed to have run a sophisticated US dollar counterfeiting program for decades and to have used this illicit currency to buy materials for its weapons program. In Australia, however, the polymer banknote has been largely resistant to counterfeiting. But this durability has created other problems, unanticipated problems, for the police and financial intelligence community. Australia's world-class scientific agency, the CSIRO, has had some big wins over the years. Without the CSIRO, we might not have the essential creature comforts of Wi-Fi, extended life contact lenses, AeroGuard or softly washing detergent for extracting stubborn grime from those sensitive Aussie merino garments. One of the CSIRO's greatest innovations, however, is stashed in bank vaults, safes, wallets and mattresses the world over. The polymer banknote. Back in 1966, Australia had a big problem. Counterfeiting. The country had just switched over from pounds to decimal currency. The dollars we all covet and spend our lives chasing furiously today. The first Australian dollars used cutting-edge technology. They were printed on high-quality paper with metal thread, watermarks and embossed in taglio printing. But to the horror of the RBA's chairman, Dr. H.C. Nugget Coombs, it took the crooks just a few months to achieve a high-grade forgery. Within a year, forged Aussie dollars were accumulating in tills and bank vaults all over the country. Being an innovative bloke, Nugget called the boffins at the Commonwealth Science Lab. He figured there must be a better way. And so, on April Fool's Day in 1968, a group of scientists, academics and central bankers met in the New South Wales town of Threadbow by the ski slopes for a top secret meeting. Given that the meeting took place on April Fool's Day, it should be no surprise that there was no snow. But this was no junket. The RBA had brought them together for a confidential discussion about some aspects of banknote printing. Within the confines of the gathering, the RBA officials revealed the nature of their problem. Paper money was too easy to replicate, and if the problem continued, and especially if word of this got out, it could undermine confidence in the Australian economy. A scientist from Kodak summarised the problem bluntly. 
It didn't matter how good the fancy paper and ink was, if something could be photographed, then it could also be copied and printed. The solution the group reached was to develop some sort of optically variable device. This would be something that couldn't be photographed in its entirety because it changed with an external stimulus, such as heat or light. There was only one problem. No such technology existed. Dave Solomon, a CSIRO scientist, later recalled the project as an exciting challenge for some of Australia's top scientists. Why use paper? They figured, when they had access to new and mysterious polymer plastics, the CSIRO team pumped out 50 million banknotes to demonstrate to the RBA that they could deliver at scale and on budget. To ensure they weren't inadvertently engaging in counterfeiting themselves, they printed three and seven test notes. The end result, 10 years later, was a robust banknote technology that would eventually be patented and exported to the world. As with most technological revolutions, the science outpaced the rate at which human institutions could change their thinking and behavior. Only in 1988, after another 11 years of widespread counterfeiting, was the first modern banknote released. What the scientists never could have conceived, however, was that by the turn of the century, money laundering would have grown to become a bigger criminal industry than counterfeiting. They had created a banknote that could, quite literally, survive going through a rinse cycle. Central bankers are kindly people and did not anticipate how nefariously some others might behave. Criminals, on the other hand, quickly realized that these near indestructible and almost irreplicable wedges of cash offered them a new opportunity for profit. Counterfeiting was now officially a mugs game. In 1988, Australia was kicking off the greatest party on earth to celebrate the bicentenary of its settlement by the British. Led by its beloved Larrikin Prime Minister Bob Hawke, the country was punching above its weight on the world stage. On 26 January, as streamers flew and yachts sailed around the country's turquoise waterways, Sydney Harbour was alive like never before. A palpable optimism hung in the air with the smoke that still lingered well after the colour and fury of the fireworks had subsided. Just up the road from Circular Quay, at 65 Martin Place, there was excitement within the RBA too. The central bankers were celebrating the release of their new Tentez polymer banknote. It was a way of telling the world that, at 200 years young, Australia could be a tech and financial services innovator. In this bold new era, Aussie innovators were proving Donald Horn's lucky country slur wrong. While the nation's eyes were focused on celebration, turning 200 wasn't the only big change for Australia that year. It was purely coincidental that down in Canberra, Australia's anti-money laundering regime was being birthed in a rare moment of bipartisan politics. The parliament introduced a new law to fight serious crime, primarily tax evasion and drug trafficking, by collecting intel on cash transactions of $10,000 or more. Back then, 10 grand was a big chunk of change. Six months pay for the average Aussie. Over time, of course, Canberra insiders knew that the magic of inflation would conspire with them to create a massive trove of financial intelligence. And it would be stored safely within flashy new IBM mainframe computers, which could crunch numbers better than a room full of mathematical savants. The Financial Transaction Reports Act 1988 took effect a year later, requiring banks, casinos, car yards and solicitors to report basic intelligence to the Australian Transaction Reports and Analysis Centre, the newest kid on the block in Canberra. Fast forward 30 years to 2019, and $10,000 was no longer such a vast sum. The average Aussie might now blow that on a fortnight in Bali. The country had become inconceivably wealthy over the preceding three decades. But as the nation's wealth ballooned, so too did its underground economy. Conservative estimates suggested that the nation's shadow economy had swelled to be worth some $32 billion each year. The true figure was up to three times that number, according to estimates from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. In response, the Parliament proposed banning cash transactions above $10,000. Measuring the scale of the cash economy is, of course, a guessing game. What you can audit is the amount of cash in the economy. The government had passed laws to treat money laundering as a problem for the commercial banks. But what about the RBA, which issued the currency? As you might have guessed, Canberra itself was excluded from the anti-money laundering laws. In truth, the RBA was happy to see the country's cash balance grow. It was the fuel of economic growth and the ballast of the banking system, the lifeblood of the economy. 
And because it held this view, the RBA had done precious little deep thinking to explain the scale of Australia's love affair with cold, hard cash. As a result of the banknote's durability, it could remain out of circulation almost indefinitely. It didn't rot. It could literally be washed. The AFP teams would sometimes find it concealed, in rolls, inside PVC pipes embedded in the walls of houses. They would discover it buried in backyards or packed under false floors and sheds and houses. Sometimes judicious bank tellers noted in reports to Austrac that the cash they handled smelled of mothballs, which criminals would discover to their detriment in court. Even so, cash was the perfect vehicle for tax evasion, drug deals, bribes and money laundering. By 2019, Australians were hoarding a gargantuan $76 billion of the stuff. It was the float of the criminal economy. It was the currency of addiction. It was the bricks of cash tied with lackey bands that funded Australia's outlaw motorcycle gangs. And it had infiltrated broader Australian society. Many a pensioner would buy a coffee with their own mothballed banknotes, while also clearing a healthy pension check from Centrelink. As a direct result of its innovation, the RBA had inadvertently created the banknote of choice for money launderers, tax evaders, cash couriers, mules and cuckoo smurfs the world over. If you enjoyed today's story, don't forget to like and subscribe.